telling me, boy, it's got a good rhythm. It's got a good beat to it. Jacob and I meet regularly, and we talk about the content, right? The lyrical content. I tell you what, that Living Hope pulled right out of 1 Peter. Read 1 Peter. If you need some encouragement, you need your hope strengthened, 1 Peter's the book for you. Take two, take, uh, two 1 Peter's and call me in the morning. That's what Dr. Morgan says to you today. So turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 4. Happy Father's Day. Guys, uh, we, we are treating you to a beer this morning. So... Grab their beer of the root, but grab one on your way out. All craft beers up there. Uh, grab one per dad, and uh, whatever's not consumed, I will take care of the rest happily. So, um, but uh, appreciate you guys and uh, the fathers out there, and the job you do, and parenting in general is not an easy task. So, uh, God bless you guys. And uh, I was with my dad last night, so took him out to uh, to dinner, spending time just me, my dad, my brother-in-law James and we're out talking and sharing and you know we're reminiscing about about my dad my dad you know became a single parent age 39 after my mom died of cancer and he's left to raise three kids 15 13 and 9 and at that time you know I was so self-absorbed I didn't really understand you know the position my dad was in but I tell you what I appreciate my dad so much if you've never met Ron Morgan let me just tell you, you'll never forget meeting Ron Morgan. He is just such a loving, caring man, and uh, I'm thankful for him. And, and he raised three kids. And uh, so my, the next, I'm the oldest of three. My next, uh, my next sibling is my brother. And so, you know, one of the questions that came up over dinner last night from my brother-in-law was like, how did you and your brother get along? Now, I'm going to tell you, Bryce is a pastor as well. Here's the cool thing. All three of us are in full-time ministry, all three kids which is amazing, just the hand of the, the grace of God on us. And my brother's in full-time ministry, church planner out in Buckeye. And, um, you know, my brother and I weren't close growing up. I was the extrovert. He was the introvert, right? I needed to be around people. He was fine just hanging out in his room, doing cartoons and drawing comics. And he's an amazing artist. And so my brother-in-law last night goes, what was it like growing up together? And I said, there's really only two instances that come to mind of when my brother and I really interacted. And number one was when I punched him in the gut to take the TV remote from him. That was number one. And number two is when we fell down the stairs wrestling and his head went into the wall and broke the drywall. And I said, yeah, those, those are really the two moments I, I remember the most uh, with my, my brother, my sibling. And, uh, uh, and I'm sure there's more, of course, but those are the ones that stand out. You know, this idea of sibling rivalry is not new. How many of you have siblings that uh, the rivalry would, would, yeah, it would rear its ugly head, uh, whether it's brother, brother, sister, 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 brother? I mean, when it comes to siblings, you don't have a choice in who you get as a brother or a sister. And, and yet the whole sibling rivalry thing goes back thousands of years. And the first example is what we get to talk about this morning, Cain and Abel. Turn to Genesis chapter 4. We turn to this amazing passage of Scripture where it's not just about sibling rivalry. It goes deeper than that. Because what we're going to notice now as we navigate Genesis is this shift to tell us how sin and the human condition will never be the same this side of eternity since the fall of Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3. So what we're going to see exacerbated right before our very eyes as we navigate Genesis is sin and the human condition is going to be wrecked. And when sin wrecks our lives as individuals, it's going to wreck our lives in relationship to one another. We see this with Adam and Eve in, in Genesis 3. Now it's going to be played out that, that much more on the world stage and impact not just the early ancestors, but even us today. And so we need to look at four major points here in this account. I'm praying that God shows us some new truths, some, some things that maybe as we, we're familiar with the account of Cain and Abel, maybe there's things you've never considered before. Maybe there's things that maybe we've misunderstood because really this is about belief versus unbelief. And the four points we're going to look at this morning have to do with unbelief and the corresponding effect that that unbelief has in our hearts when it comes to 
certain topics like anger and worship and things like that. So let's read the passage in its entirety. We're going to look at Genesis chapter 4, 1 through 16. And then we're going to look at the four points that I think are, are worth deeper examination. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 4, starting at verse 1. So now the man had relations with his wife, Eve. That's the Bible's way of saying they, they made love. They had sex. Okay, let's just put it out there. She conceives and gives birth to Cain. And she said, I have gotten a man child with the help of the Lord. And again, she gave birth to a, his brother Abel. And when Abel was a keeper of the flocks, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So it came about that in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord, the fruit of the ground. And Abel, on his part, also brought of the firstlings of his flock and their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain became very angry, and his countenance fell. And then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, well, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you, but you must master it. And Cain told Abel, his brother, and it came about that when they were out in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you cultivate the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. You shall be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is too great to bear. Behold, you have driven me this day from the face of the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden, and I shall be a vagrant and a wanderer of the earth, and it will come about that whoever finds me is going to kill me. So the Lord said to him, therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance will be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord appointed a sign or a mark for Cain, lest anyone finding him should slay him. So the Lord said to him, therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance will be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord appointed a sign for him, lest anyone finding him should slay him. We already read that verse, didn't we? Verse 16. And then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. So what we begin to see is that sin now not only has a personal impact, but it now has a social impact. And one of the things what, that you've probably heard me say before is that sin always hurts the innocent. The sin that is in our hearts, the sin that is derived from our, our, the core of who we are as human beings, always hurts the innocent. And here we have a chapter full of firsts. We have the first birth of Cain. We've got the first murder. Uh, we've got all these firsts happening. But let's back up. Let's talk about the first point, Cain's offering which is a picture of unbelief and acceptable worship. So Eve, Adam, they give birth to their first baby. Cain, they're excited about this. And perhaps Eve is excited in bringing this child into the, the world. As it says in, in verse 1, she says, Wow, I have been able to bring a man-child into the Lord with the help of the Lord. See, these two had been created by God. Adam and Eve had been created by God, but this is the first time that they participated in creating a human being. So she's excited, and maybe some of her excitement is back to Genesis 3, verse 15, where it says, your seed will crush the head of the serpent. Right? Maybe there's this idea that... <gasps> This is the promised deliverer. This is the promised rescuer. Well, her excitement is going to be short-lived once we find out about what he's really going to do. And then she gives birth to a second baby, a little boy named Abel, right? Which means frailty. So maybe there's been some lessons learned between Cain and Abel. Now, what I want you to note, because here's a big question, is where did all the other people of the earth come from? 
because Cain's worried in his later years of being murdered who finds out, being murdered himself of anyone that finds out about his killing of his own brother. So so many critics would say, well, where does the, the, the other people of the earth come from? You've got to imagine that between verses 2 and 3 of Genesis 4, and you may want to write this down in your notes or your Bible, Adam and Eve have other children. These are the two that are highlighted for us because this is not a genealogy account. This is a historical record to show us how sin is running rampant. The writer of Genesis is not concerned to give you all the children that Adam and Eve have, both boys and girls. And between verses 2 and 3, obviously Cain and Abel grow up that they have occupations now. So this is a huge time gap where Adam and Eve have other children, which also means that those children have relationships with each other to populate the earth. So God allowed intermarriage between siblings to take place. Why? Because this was the way to populate the earth. There did come a point in Old Testament history where God said, you shall no longer intermarry with your siblings, but he permitted it for a while when the genetic pool was not as corrupted as it is today. That's why we don't marry our brother and sister and have kids with them. But at the time, God permitted it to happen so much so, so that decades passed and more and more people filled the earth. So Adam, so Adam and Eve have two boys, which are highlighted for us here. And it's a relationship that serve as some talking points now, because now they have occupations. Cain is a tiller of the ground. So he works in agriculture, right? He brings forth a harvest of, of wheat and fruit and veggies and who knows what. Abel is one who works with animals. He is a shepherd, the first shepherd. Both are commendable occupations. Both are wonderful vocations, and yet they are taught also that as, as they work, they're also worshipers, and they worship God through their work. Henceforth, they bring forth something from their work to the table of worship. So look at verse 3, because now the, the, the narrative is trying to tell us something about worship. So in the course of time, Cain brought an offering to the Lord from the fruit of the ground. Adam and Eve taught their boys you honor God. And there's a time and there's a place where you bring the fruit of your labors to the table of the Lord and you worship him. Abel does the same thing, verse 4. And it says that Abel brought his part, but notice there's an extensive description of Abel's offering over Cain's offering. Abel brought the first fruit of his work. He brought the fat. He brought the best. And it says that the Lord had regard for Abel's offering, but he had no regard for Cain's. Here we have a picture of acceptable worship, and yet we have a person who's trying to worship God, but he's doing it from a heart of unbelief, Cain. And can I tell you something? You're going to want to write this down. All of our human base problems are ultimately a worship problem. Every single person is a worshiper. The problem is most people worship inadequately or incorrectly. Our role as believers in Christ is to bring the message of true worship to people. People worship all sorts of things. They worship trees. They worship animals. They worship songwriters. They worship movie stars. But yet God understands how important worship is at the core of who we are as humans because we're created to be worshipers. The problem is most people worship amiss. And so acceptable worship is worship according to God's terms, not our terms. When we approach God, we approach him not based upon what we want. We approach him based upon what he demands. So the fact that Cain approached God the way he wanted to approach God was the reason God had no regard for his worship. The reason God has regard for Abel's offering is because Abel came on God's terms. Cain comes on his, Abel comes on 
gods. This is why Hebrews chapter 11, the great hall of faith chapter, starts with the example of Abel being a man of faith and doing what God wanted. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts, and through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. So Abel speaks to everyone thereafter, telling us what acceptable worship is to look like. And there's two things I want you to know in your, in your notes. Number one, there is the quality of our offering that when we understand what God has done for us, we want to give him the best in response to his love showed to us. We don't give the Lord trivial offerings. We don't give the Lord secondhand offerings. We don't give the Lord whatever is left over, the crumbs, etc., etc. We give God the best because here's the question. Did God not give us the best? So therefore, the quality of our offerings, this is why the Bible says when it comes to your, your money that's entrusted to you, you give God the first fruits of your offering. Look at Proverbs chapter 3. Whatever comes in, you say, God, you're getting the first and you're getting the best. That's what God looks for in the heart of someone who truly worships him. So there's the quality of our offering. We give God the best. But more importantly, the second lesson in, in, in offering and in worship with God is not just the quality of the offering, it's the character of the offerer. And I'm going to tell you something right now, and, and this is so Twitter-worthy. I hope you guys are ready for this. Offerings from faith always surpass offerings of value. The heart is what God is after. This is why the widow in Mark chapter 12 is commended because she comes and gives slivers of copper, uh, copper in light of all the rich religious Pharisees giving loads and loads of money. Jesus commends her because ultimately worship is about your heart, not about your offering. Now, we pray that the offering comes from a place where you're genuinely in love with God and you want to give him the best and he knows by where you're at when it comes to faith. But there's no substitute for where your heart is at when it comes to worship. He does not want empty ritual. He does not want lifeless duty. He wants a heart of a person that has been so enthralled and captured by his love. You say, thank you, God. Thank you. I give you the best. I give you the, the premier part of, of what I've earned because you, God, are a good God, a loving God, a gracious God. And so this is what the Bible highlights and celebrates. We see it here in Genesis 4. We see it all the way throughout Scripture that God is not impressed with the blood of bulls and goats, but he's impressed by a heart of obedience that delights itself in the, in the, in the law of the Lord. And so. That's acceptable worship. Cain misses it. Because what Cain does is not by faith. This is why Jude, verse 11, says there are those who live the way of Cain. And there's really two ways of worship and only two ways. And those, this is in your notes. There's the way of Cain. Jude 11 says that Cain, the way of Cain is marked by those who do things selfishly. Woe to them, Jude says, for they walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's heir and persisted in Korah's rebellion. These are Old Testament examples of men who come before God and wanted God to conform to their standard, not them conform to God's. And there's tons of people out there that want God to conform to them. And God will not bow to your will. God will not bow to your wishes. He will not bow to your whims. You worship God on his terms, which is the way of Christ. In contrast to the way of Cain is the way of Christ, which is really the way of the cross. And it is by faith that we now approach God with acceptable worship. 
not just the quality of our offerings, not just the character of the offerer, but the fact that by faith we come to him and conform to his standards, not expecting him to conform to ours. Just like I'm driving down the street just yesterday, and I drive by a church that's got a lit marquee up on the main thoroughfare running by the church, and it shows a picture of a Christian fish with, with Jesus written in it. You guys, you guys have seen them on the cars, right? And then it's got a fish kissing the fish, and then that fish has got Darwin written, and they're kissing. And as a church, they declare, we love evolution. I, I was ready to, like, just go right into that marquee, just drive right into that sign. I'm sitting there going, really? Here are church, And there are churches... Whatever you want to believe, whatever lifestyle you want to pursue, there's going to be churches that cater to you. And there's people that flock to those churches. Why? Because we're going to minimize the, the will of God and the word of God, and we're going to maximize whatever makes you feel good. Come on in. This is a church for you. Might as well call it me church, right? The church starts when I want it to start. It serves the kind of coffee I want. It's, it's going to support my lifestyle. It's going to support my beliefs. And yet God grieves because there's millions of people worshiping every single day, but they're all worshiping inadequately and incorrectly. God help us. Because the worship problem is at the core of all of our problems. And you look around us and whatever's going on in the Middle East, whatever's going on in North Korea, whatever's going on in our local public schools is an issue of the heart. And we want everyone to kowtow to our desires and wishes and we have forsaken the way of Christ and we embrace the way of Cain. God says, this is acceptable worship. You come to Christ. You come to him. And don't get offended by it. Can I tell you how there's probably no greater word on our lips than the word offended. You've offended me because you looked at me a certain way. You've offended me because you've labeled my children a certain way. And we live in this really thin-skinned culture where it's going to get worse right? People like, oh, you disagree with me? I'm hurt. I'm going to sue you. And we need to start growing some thicker skin because God is the one who puts up with us and shows us such grace and kindness every single day, right? And yet we need to learn that life is not about us. Life is not about my way or your way. God it is about Yahweh. Amen? It is about God. It's about his way. And we need to realize that God is going to do things that offend us. God is going to do things to disrupt us. That doesn't mean we become all pouty face, right? Like Cain. And literally, that's the translation. Look at verse 5. And Cain became very, very, very angry, and he became pouty faced. I mean, that's what's going on there. And God says, why are you so pouty faced, Cain? Because the world doesn't revolve around me. Duh. Pull up your big boy pants. Grow some thick skin and realize there are going to be things that offend you. But the offense from God is always good. The offense of God and what he demands of our lives is always good. Because what does that say? I accept it because I'm going to trust him who knows all in light of me who I don't know everything. So I'm going to allow a minor offense to grip my heart and realize maybe he knows what's best. Are you willing to be offended by God? Are you willing to be challenged by him? Are you willing to wrestle with God? Because we're so quick with the question, how can God do a thing like this? We're so quick with, why does God permit this? Because so many times we want God to operate according to our own program. And this is not about your program, you guys. As much as your mom and daddy told you is about you, it's not about you. It's about God. It's about his kingdom. It's about Christ. And so, what's it going to be? Is it going to be life on your terms, the way of Cain, which is ultimately unacceptable, and God has no regard for that? Or will it be the way of Christ conforming to what God wants? Because there's enough pouty-faced Christians out there. There's enough pouty-faced people walking around like, Ugh. we have to learn that mumbling and grumbling and complaining is a sin. 
You have no reason to be so uptight with your lot in life because God is a God of sovereignty and he's also a God of grace and you're exactly where God has you today, right here, right now. And you sit there and go, God, I don't understand it, but I accept it. Read Psalm 73 this week. As salve for your pouty-faced hearts. Because David says, I don't understand, God, what you're doing, and I'm not happy about what you're doing. But Psalm 73 says, but when I came into the sanctuary of God, my perspective changed. And isn't that it? Isn't it? Coming into relationship with God, we begin to see things not as we want to see them, but we see things as we need to see them from God's perspective. And so Cain's offering and his heart of unbelief ought to challenge us all and remind us what acceptable worship looks like because there's nothing more important for you to embrace than the life of a worshiper and a one who's going to worship the way of Christ. Amen? Second point. Then there's Cain's heart, which we've already kind of broached a little bit. It's really about unbelief and anger uncontrolled. Look at verse 6. And the Lord God said to Cain, why are you angry? Why are you ticked off? Why are you all pouty face?" right? Like, isn't it cool that God approaches us and asks us questions because he's, he's trying to draw something out of our hearts? Look at verse 7. If you do well, Cain, Will it not be better for you, right? Will not your countenance change? Will you not be now not pouty-faced? But if you do not do well, there are consequences. Sin is crouching at the door. Literally, there is a beast at your door ready to pounce if you give it allowance to do it. It's desires for you, but you must master it. And Cain told Abel his brother, and it came about that when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel and killed him. So the situation here is Cain's heart, right? And there's a God who's wooing his heart. There's a God who's approaching Cain, and he's saying to him, Cain, let's talk. Because there's something you need to control, the core of who you are, your heart. And if you don't control your heart, your heart's going to control you, and it's not going to be good. I mean, grace is written all over this. Patience is written all over this. Is it not God's kindness that leads us to repentance? See, throughout this whole text, God is kind because he wants to bring about change in Cain's heart. But Cain is refusing to listen. Cain wants things his way, and he's not going to bow to any other way. And you need to understand this morning, you guys, that here's a man who is not blamed for bringing his offerings to God. He's not blamed for getting it wrong, right? God wants to teach him. If Cain were open to be instructed, if he was teachable, we'd have a whole different uh, narrative on our hands. Isn't it, uh, when God confronts you with something you don't like or you may not like or, be, or accept, or you allow it to be a teachable moment. You allow it to be a time where God's going to say, I want to teach you something, because that's exactly what God's doing. And if Cain were open to the instruction, if Cain, we'd have a whole different story on our hands. But Cain wants it his way, and, and, and his evil intentions in light of his brother's righteous behavior is going to do nothing but become more aggressive, because here's the passages from Scripture, and they're not on the screen, write them down. 2 Timothy 3.12 All who desire a godly life in Christ will be persecuted. See, when people want things their way and they see God's way demonstrated in their presence, they don't like it. And it's not because they don't like you, they don't like Christ. This is why Paul in Colossians 4 says, I am filling up in my body the afflictions people have towards Jesus. And so you need to understand that all who desire to live a godly life in a context of people that don't want God, they want to do things their way, they're not going to like you. And Jesus himself said it, right? Jesus says, you're going to be hated for my name's sake. Some of you will be put to death, even by those that are your moms and dads and brothers and sisters. Could have Jesus been thinking about this context, right, when he's teaching these things? He's like, yeah, you know about Cain and Abel. And all of a sudden, there is not just a homicide that takes place. This is called fratricide. 
a sibling killing a sibling. Now it's not just the first murder, it's the first extreme case of sibling rivalry where there is another who is born in the same household. Maybe there's similarities in their hair color, their eye color, but there is someone so much like Cain that he is so callous and indifferent he kills his own brother. And it's almost like the brother brings the lamb, right? The brother brings the animal and, and, is, and, is, and is regarded by God. And it's almost like Cain toward God is saying, oh, you want an animal sacrifice? You want to, and kills his brother right there in the field. And it's premeditated because it says he woos him out into the field. He woos him to a place where he knows no one's going to hear his scream, no one's going to hear his cry, and he kills him right there. And I'm going to tell you something, you guys. That murder is an act of hatred ultimately toward God. Bonhoeffer said it this way. Why does Cain murder? Out of hatred for God. And I want you to write this down. Another Twitter moment right here at, at Missio Day. If there's no respect or no trust for God, there will be no respect for other people. Where trust for God is diminished, human life and its value will be diminished. How can you worship a creator and have disdain for the creature created in his image? How could you renounce a creator and thus renounce his image? See, you guys have to understand that there's a reason why we have so much violence erupting in our world, in our country, in our culture. Violence stems from a place that says, I have disregard for the creator. And when you have disregard for the creator, you will have disregard for the creation. And this strikes at every single one of our hearts because you're sitting there going, hey, you know what, Scott, this message is great, but I haven't killed my brother. Have you? I'm going to tell you right now how we're all murderers sitting right here this morning at this moment. 1 John chapter 3. How can we forget these words that say, We should not be like Cain who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Notice this. Because his deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. So John is saying there's something that goes on in all of our hearts when other people excel beyond where we're at. They have success in areas that we want success. We are envious. We are jealous. And because we see God blessing other people's lives, what happens to us? We get resentful. Because we don't want to see other people do better than us. And don't sit there and go, that's never happened to me. Baloney. Here's how Jesus puts it. He says, you have heard it said. Days of old, Matthew chapter 5, verse 21. You have heard it said. I'm going to go to this screen. Matthew. Rejoice and be glad. Oh, we got the wrong passage up there. It's okay. I'm going to read it. It should be Matthew 5, 21. Let me read it for you. Have you not heard it said you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment? Why? Because if you do not bridle anger, which is the seed of murder, it will manifest itself. And if you tell me you've never murdered someone, if you've ever had anger in your heart, you have thus murdered them. And Jesus says, here's what you do before you even go to the altar of worship. You know you have an issue with another person. You go and be reconciled to that person. Get rid of the anger. Be at peace with them. And then come back and worship God. That's the instruction. Because Jesus knows we've all been angry with somebody. We've all grown resentful towards somebody. And Jesus says, your first responsibility as my child is you leave church, you leave that place of worship, you leave that place where you're ready to give the best offering, and you deal with the relationship with another human being because perhaps that is the most ultimate expression of worship is how we can be at peace with one another. Amen? A failure to trust God will inevitably lead to a failure to respect another person. Because what is love ultimately about? It is about celebrating someone else's success. What is love all about? Willingly giving yourself to see someone else do better than you could do. 
Is this not the way of Jesus, who did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many? Is this not the way of Jesus, Philippians chapter 2, who considered others as more important than himself? So here's the passage, right? It is, it is love that is not jealous of other people's gifts. It is love that is not resentment of other people's service to God. It is love that is not hatred of other people's spiritual success. It is love that's not angry, that God delights in their offerings versus mine. 1 Corinthians 13, right? The great love chapter. Love always hopes, love always perseveres. There's a joy involved in love that you see God working in someone's life and you celebrate it. You weep with those who weep, you, re you rejoice with those who rejoice, and you consider it great because God is sovereign, and he's working. And yet Cain couldn't embrace this. Can I tell you guys, you got to be careful with your hearts. you got to be careful with what is going on in your heart, because the word to Cain of warning is the same word of warning to us. If you don't master it, there's this sin like a wild beast crouching at your door and it will pounce and it will be destructive. And when it comes to your heart, it can be anger, it can be lust, it can be whatever that is not honoring to God. If we don't master it, it will master us. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you're in Christ, God gives you the strength to master it. Don't come to me with excuses. Because if it's this unending cycle of excuses, I'm going to tell you right now, the wrong fruit indicates the wrong root. If you are manifesting fruit that is not in line with the glory and good and will of God, there is something going on in your heart and perhaps maybe you don't believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's a hard thing to say. Because we're all in church. Therefore, we must all be saved. No. There are perhaps more people that are damned in our churches than outside of our churches. But we wonder why we get in the same cycle of sin. Well, perhaps it's because the root of the gospel of Jesus Christ has really never taken root. I'm not saying you never sin. I'm not saying that your life is perfect. But what I'm going to say is, you begin to grow in your mastery over sin, henceforth mastery over your heart, and you in Christ become a radically different person. And if you're dealing with the same old stuff over and over again, you need to look at your heart. Because wrong fruit indicates wrong root. That's another, there's three Twitter worthy quotes right there this morning. Because what ought to be manifested in the heart of a child who loves Jesus Christ? Love, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, brotherly love, generosity, humility. Shall I continue? I was convicted on the first one. Maybe you were convicted on the third one. Maybe we were convicted by all of them. But all I know is you cannot persist in sin and have security that you're saved. Twit, tweeter number, twit number four. Twit number four. Tweet number four. We're all twits, honestly. We are all twits. Um, so is the gospel at the core of your life, you guys? Are you earnestly and aggressively mastering the things that are trying to master you. With Christ, you can do it because you're more than a conqueror in Him. Amen? You must have victory in these areas. You must rely on God's strength to do it. You can't do it on your own steam. It's His wisdom, not your wisdom. But ultimately, it is the way of Christ, and the way of Christ will always lead to the will of Christ, and the wanting of Christ, and the desire for Christ. And you will choose what Christ wants because it is His Spirit now in you. I'm, I'm amazed at, at what enthralls us and gets our attention. We're so, we're so, we live lives of such disregard towards one another, especially. 
and loving others. Like all of a sudden it's this evangelical surprise like, you know, oh, we ought to love one another. We ought to be leading the parade in the world of loving others unconditionally. Amen? And you know what we're concerned about? We're concerned about a raccoon climbing 20 stories up a skyscraper in St. Paul, Minnesota. Did you guys miss that story this week? The world was enraptured because a little rodent got 20 stories up a high rise in St. Paul and millions of people are fixated. Hope he lives, hope he lives. And you have no regard for your neighbor, but you're more excited about the raccoon. God help us. Am I, is, that, is that not truthful? We become so excited about the trivial, mundane, and, 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 and things of no value and we're missing out of showing people value because they are created in the image of God. We've gone the way of Cain because we'd rather kill people in our hearts because we want God on our terms rather than showing Christ-like love to those who desperately need it. Which leads us to point number three. Cain's responsibility. This idea there's there's unbelief in his heart and there's accountable love. We are held accountable for the love we show other people. This is why, here it is, verse 9. Lord calls to Cain, where is Abel your brother? Now notice how eerily similar this question is to the one that was proposed to Adam just one chapter prior. The question to Adam was an individual question. Where are you? This is now a social question. Where is your brother? And perhaps these two questions are the most important questions we can ask ourselves. Number one, where are you when it comes to God's voice calling to you? God wants your heart. He wants your life. And once he has your heart, once he has your life, now there's this responsibility we have towards one another. You see how God, through the question, is not seeking information. He's basically seeking a confession. Where am I, God? I've wandered. Where am I? I've sinned. Where am I? I've done disgrace to you. And God says, come out of hiding. Come out of shame and let me love you. God's voice and his question is always an invitation back into relationship. That's why he says to Cain, Where's your brother? Cain, come out of hiding. Come to grips with your heart. And realize that you have shirked your responsibility towards those that I gave to you in your life to be accountable to. We're to look out for one another. And look what Cain says. He says, I do not know. Denial, lie, that's where sin takes you. And a repudiation of responsibility. Am I my brother's keeper? Like, don't put that on me. Are you kidding me? As if this is an elective in the course of life. We are called to look out for each other. Right? And we don't use the scriptures to justify our lack of love or care for people. Jeff Sessions. Oh, you guys ready for this? Now, I'm not going to question, well, I might challenge policy. And it's not Donald Trump's problem. I have an issue when all of a sudden you get a political figure up there that misquotes and distorts God's word. This country has become Bible scholars the past few days, especially in the chapter 13 of Romans. Everyone thought the most popular Bible verse up to this point was John 3.16? No, it's, John, it's Romans 13. And yes, we submit to government, but that is not an excuse to show people who need help, care, and compassion. And yeah, we've got a messed up system. We need to figure out how we can help these families and not separate parents from their children and children from their parents. Amen? Because in the words of Stephen Colbert, the great current theologian right now, Jeff Sessions missed out on verse 10 where he says, you love your neighbor. And I don't care what that, I don't care if you're Democrat, Republican, I don't care if you're a Don, Donald Trump supporter. Or De, What we have to realize is we live in a culture that is using political politics as a spiritual sledgehammer, and we've got to refuse that. 
We need to embrace the spirit of Christ as evangelicals, those who claim the name of Jesus, and we ought to show care and compassion for every single person. I don't care what your skin color is. I don't care what country you're seeking refuge from. I don't care your sexual orientation. You are created in the image of God. Therefore, you deserve love. trying to brother you do not hurt others without hurting God himself and when you wound somebody else you wound the image of God on this earth as if there's not enough wounding already are you kidding me put your politics aside and put on your Jesus britches and do something good for God's sake how's that tweet number five because you know why we're where we're at? We have deadened our consciences, even in the church, because we have this refusal to listen to the voice of God. Where is your brother? Where's your coworker? Where's your neighbor? Where's that guy that does the elliptical with you at the gym? Where's the guy that you go to soccer games with? Where are the people in your lives? And I'm not talking about location. I'm talking about the spiritual state of their hearts. Where are they? Because you have a responsibility to care, to show concern, and to extend love and compassion at whatever cost is required because isn't that what God has given to you in Jesus? And look what it says in verse 9 and 10. Verse 10, he says, Why, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Stop right there. Is that not a haunting verse? What does the blood of Abel's voice cry? It cries, God, vindicate my cause. His voice shrieks, have vengeance. Take vengeance. This is an injustice that has been committed. Will you please right the wrong? See, the blood of Abel is a blood and cry for justice. That's your first point you need to understand. And every single person that dies in vain at the hands of abusive, selfish, murderous, angry, resentful people is a voice that calls to God. God, vindicate me. Make this right, wrong, wrong right, please. And the blood of Abel cries out for justice because there has been now a man who has taken God's possession. Every single human life is God's possession. And it is an assault on his sovereignty. And it's an assault on what God owns. And the blood of Abel cries out and says, Do not allow me to be shoveled underground. I cry to you. I complain to you. Take notice of this event and do what is right, God. But I'm going to tell you right now that the blood of justice, if that is what you are seeking, if you adopt a justice plan in and of yourselves, it will not accomplish ultimate satisfaction. When man seeks justice, it gets worse. It doesn't get better. That's why the blood of Jesus cries louder than the blood of Abel. This is why the writer of Hebrews verses uh, 24 in chapter 12 says this. Don't miss this. It says in chapter 12 of Hebrews, verse 24, And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. You know why Jesus' blood is a better word than the blood of Abel? Because, again, when it comes to justice, it will always be unsatisfying if you pursue it. But the blood of Jesus is the blood of forgiveness, and that is what every human being desperately needs. You don't want justice, especially from the sovereign supreme hand of God, because a just God will squash you and condemn you to eternity in hell. What we want is forgiveness and the grace and the mercy that comes only by his hands, and we trust him because he's the one in Romans 12 that says, vengeance is mine. Do not repay evil for evil, but do something better, because the blood of Jesus is supremely better than the blood of Abel. Amen? 
Don't be a justice seeker in the sense of trying to have your vengeance assuaged. It will never be satisfied. And if you take justice in your own hands, don't become a Liam Neeson kind of Christian. It will never get better. Justice in our hands gets worse. God will have the last say. Amen? He will right every wrong. Amen? And the blood of Jesus, which is the blood of forgiveness, is the clarion call we send to the world because it's where every single person is at. We are in desperate need of forgiveness. Woo! That's why it's better. Last point. Cain's punishment. There are consequences. Cain is going to be punished because there are consequences. We have to, we have to realize, realize that sin brings consequences. And yet in the light of Cain's punishment and his unbelief, there's awesome mercy that is shown by God. Look at verse 11. And now you are cursed. Up to this point, no human being in the world has been cursed. The serpent was cursed, but now Cain is cursed. Can you imagine being cursed by God for the sins that you've committed? And notice what happens. From the ground you, uh, you will be cursed, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. And when you cultivate the ground, it will no longer yield. Like your work will now be inhibited and you will not find a piece of land that's going to do for you what you had experienced previously and therefore you will continue to look for that place that's going to yield its fruit and bring forth vegetation and you will not find it you will wander you will be a vagabond you will be desperate you will be homeless this is your curse Cain and Cain says in verse 13 my punishment is too great to bear oh (laughs) you know He's more concerned, listen to this, he's more concerned about self-pity and his life than he is in remorse and being broken before a holy God. May you never become like Cain, where you're more concerned about your lot in life than it is the remorse and the brokenness you're to have before a holy God. And behold, you have driven me this day from the face of the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I'm going to be a wanderer, a vagrant, and it will come about that whoever finds me will kill me. Now he's concerned about his protection. And I'm going to tell you right now, God gives Cain. There's three marks going on here. There's this mark of Cain that God gives him. And let me just tell you, theologians have been trying to figure out the mark of Cain. I'm not going to waste your time. People said, maybe it was a tattoo, you know, Jay-Z forever, I don't know, whatever the tattoo says. Maybe it was a haircut, Beatles-ish, you know, you get the bowl for free after you get the haircut. Maybe some, some Hebrew scholars thought he had dogs that served as protectors of him. I'm going to tell you, there's three marks that I want you to recognize in this passage. Number one, there's the mark of divine protection. And this is where awesome mercy is shown. Did God have to protect Cain? He could have just left him high and dry. But yet God says to Cain, no one will lay a hand on you. Which is amazing. This is what we call God's common grace. Every single person born into this world experiences the sunshine, whether you're saved or not saved. We all experience the rain. God, we need more in Arizona, please. We all experience the rain, right, whether we're saved or unsaved. God is showing this world protective grace because he could have taken us all out a long time ago. So there's the mark of protective grace, the the divine protection. Then there's the mark of grace, which doesn't remove Cain from the world, but allows him to continue. And you would think you'd read something about, and then Cain came to his senses, and his heart was broken before God, and he submitted to God. But he doesn't. And yet, that's grace. 
who we have a God who does not desire for anyone to perish, but for all to come to eternal life, right? And the fact that every person that wakes up today has a new day to realize that today is the day of salvation. This is a day of grace. And that is a mark of God's divine mercy on us. That he protects us and he shows us grace. And yet the third mark is, is one that I think ought to serve us well, and that's a mark of warning. Do not go the way of Cain. Because now Cain is going to be the poster child for the person that is obstinate, that refuses to submit to God. Now Cain walks as a walking, living billboard of what it looks like when you live life on your terms and you refuse to submit to God's terms. And it is lonely, and it is homeless, and it is hungry, and there's no purpose. That's what sin does. Sin separates us from our most vital relationships. God, number one, each other, number two, and any sort of purpose and significance we try to put our hands at, number three. Sin always leads to separation. And that is a word of warning to us today. Let me ask you this morning, church, brothers and sisters, I hope all in Christ, do you see yourself at some place in this narrative today? Do you see yourself in some point of what we had talked about and said, God is stabbing my heart right now. God is showing me Perhaps the beauty of Jesus like he's never shown me before. Act on that. Maybe he's shown you how selfish you've been in your relationships with other people. Maybe there are issues of resentment inside your heart that God says, you leave church and you go do that because that's a greater act of worship than being here and pretending something's not going on. You be reconciled. As far as it depends upon you, here's what the Bible says, you be at peace with all people. Does God today demand you to be a peacemaker in some relationship? Do it. Does he demand you to be a more caring, compassionate person with those around you in this world? Then do it. But do not refuse today to, list, to disregard the voice of God and thus further deaden your conscience. Because the warning of Cain is a warning to us. There's a better way. There's a better life. There's a better purpose. And it starts with and continues in the spirit of Christ. So I call us back to that place. It is the blood of Christ, which is the blood of forgiveness, which now gives us a platform to go and love and forgive and show grace to all people. Will you be that person? today and forever. With the grace and help of God, will you be that person? Amen? Let's stand, let's pray. Father, you are once again highlighted in, in, in the scriptures to be a God of such incredible love and mercy and grace and tenderness. Lord, I'm thankful we don't have, in this case, an example of you just putting somebody out and, and not showing them such tenderness, and yet it, it's a good reminder for all of us that we, we ultimately need to turn our hearts over to you. We've done a horrible job trying to master our lives. We allow you to be master over us. We want you to be the one who calls the shot who makes the plan, who gives us the strength and the, and the wisdom to do what you want us to do. Forgive us for being so self-absorbed and self-focused. Lord, I pray that today would bring about a radical change in, in your people that are called by your name, who love Jesus, that we would start to look more like Christ as we continue to submit to you, even when we don't understand, even though when it's hard to trust. Lord, we bow before you in humility because you know all and you know what's best. 
So Lord, forgive us for the ways we've been angry and we've been hateful and we've shown indifference and we've shown a lack of compassion. Lord, your voice speaks to us and we're so glad it does. Continue to speak and allow us to not just listen, but to heed what you would have for us. Be glorified in our lives. Be glorified in this church. Be glorified in the world as we go forth in the spirit, in the name of Jesus. And we pray all of this in Christ's name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face up towards you give you his grace and mercy forever and ever. God bless you guys. Have a great Sunday. Happy Father's Day. All dads, grab a beer on your way out. You don't hear that. Hey, thanks for watching the video. We uh, hope you've been blessed and encouraged by, uh, by watching it. Stay tuned for future videos. Uh, if you're ever in the Phoenix area, we'd love for you to join us in person at Sozo Coffee. We're at Warner and Alma School. Two services every Sunday, 9 and 1045. Check out the churchisaverb.org for more information. Have a great week. We'll see you soon. Thank you.